My name is Don C. I am an alcoholic. I also am a member of the Mohican Nation. I was born for the Turtle Clan on my mother's side, and I was born for the Coyote Clan on my father's side. And my Indian name is Tantanka Wambli. It was given to me by the elders when I was given the responsibility to uh, be keeper of what's called the sacred hoop of a hundred eagle feathers. Um, You know, the elders, they always tell us that whenever we gather together, before anything starts, we should always take the time to connect with each other. That's the most important thing that we could do. And so uh, I know that there is an elder here who is sober 61 years. And uh, so uh, with his permission, I would uh, do this opening that our elders uh, taught us. And the other thing it will do is... uh, Help me relax a little bit because this is really um, a, a different experience up here. So how the elders taught us to do that is to connect with each other. Uh, we call it uh, an opening. And uh, first we uh, put down these four collars. It's called red, yellow, black, and white. And uh, when we put those down, it's to remind us that when the Creator created creation that the creator did not make four races but the creator only made one race and just like you have flowers you have different color flowers you have birds different color birds and that each one of us when we are in the womb then the creator assigns to us an earth suit and so then when we are born we come out with the suit but there's not four races there's only one like, wouldn't it be a trip if we had a room before you come in here? You go in this room, you unzip your earth suit, and you peel out of it. <laughs> That'd be so cool. You wouldn't have to be careful or nothing. You just, you know, just be a drunk and talk about recovery, and that'd be really cool. And so, uh, how we do the connectedness is uh, with a medicine, and uh, we call it sage. And uh, how it is believed is that each plant is, has a purpose. Everything has a purpose that the Creator made. There's nothing that is without purpose. Of course, we human beings, uh, we don't always agree with that. Like when we see certain plants, we don't like them. We call them weeds. Darn weeds, how come they're here? But yet they're here for a purpose. They're food for something. They're here to do something. Or sometimes... Uh, we don't like certain animals, all of those pests. We label things we don't like. And unfortunately, we do that amongst ourselves sometimes. We don't say pests or weeds, but we say, you know how those kind are. You know? But uh, really, uh, we are all here for a reason. And uh, how we do this connectedness is this particular plant, it's sage leaves and uh Every plant, the medicine is contained within a plant. You have to know how to get it out. And um, some you soak in water, and then the water will make it into tea, and then you drink it. The sage plant is you light it, it turns into smoke, and then the medicine actually comes out in the smoke. And uh, for those of you who are in charge, we only light a very, very little bit because we know about the conflict between technology and traditions. (laughs) And so, fear not. (laughs) And then how we uh, distribute the medicine is we light the medicine and it starts to smoke. And then the medicine comes out in that smoke. And then we take like an eagle fan. This is a feather. This was given to us by Bill Aaron Moggison. And you put the, the medicinal trap on the fan. And then you take it and you throw it. And it goes a long distance. What the medicine does, it helps us to connect with each other. Because as we know in this program, I think that's why the steps say we, not I. Because uh, I cannot do this without you. And um, and so I I just want to thank you for allowing me to to do this. And uh, it also, you know, helps helps me too. <laughs> uh, and then what the elders tell us is that 
Whenever you are in the presence of an eagle feather, you cannot lie. You cannot, um, you're supposed to honor that. And so uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to just leave this feather out because I am an alcoholic, you know. So I'm gonna... <laughs> Um, so first I would just like to uh, tell you my, my gratitude of uh, being here. In many of our traditional ways, that whenever a guest is invited to your camp, you treat that guest with great honor and respect. That's how you do it. In uh, James, um, uh, they call it a host, but we liked him so well we started to tease him. Now we call him our scout. You know, and, uh, but that's the way you know it. It, it was for uh, for me here. It's I felt just like that traditional way. I felt a part of you. I didn't. I got out of the car, and there James is right at the door, and uh, you know he's just been there really for us. And everyone here is so friendly. You know, it just uh, felt very very welcome to your camp. And so I'm really honored, you know, to uh, to to be here. And uh, I also would like to honor my daughter Amanda. It's right here. She could just stand up. Um, Amanda is my. Mm -hmm. um, Amanda's in recovery, and I'm very proud of her. And I have a lot of respect for her. She's a what we call a young person with the old spirit. And uh, she's just, um, you know, really um, a blessing to uh, to our family. And I'd say I'd like to say a special, you know, good morning to my my relatives from, um, you know, the various communities here. And um, I'd like to say a special welcome to to our veterans who are in recovery, our warriors, because um, we know that this process works for you too. And um, so we're really honored, you know, to have you here. And uh, and I always like to acknowledge uh, the Al-Anon. Um, if it wasn't for at that time when I had to uh, find this program, uh, at that time I was married. And I remember uh, when she started going to Al-Anon, I didn't know what it was. I liked it because when she would go that way, i go this way. <laughs> but it wasn't a very few weeks I noticed. I remember the weekend when she got what Al-Anon was about. My life changed tremendously. <laughs> But I really um, am, am grateful for the, for the Al-Anon. Um, your program is incredible. I ended up going to Al-Anon for three years one time. I really needed to go there, and it changed my whole AA program. I finally got uh, what was different, and it was uh, the secret that uh, Al-Anon, you know, that you knew. Um, so it's been a, a life-changing experience you know, uh, coming to, to your camp. Um, so while you taught me, uh, it seems like everything, you know, in some ways you feel like kind of, what am I going to say? Because everything I know about this, you taught me already. So it's like you already know what I'm going to say. And, uh, and uh, anything that is a value you, to me as far as my life um, was able to change. I got this from you. So uh, one of the things you taught me was to uh, just share my experience, strength, and hope, to tell what happened and uh, what it was like and what it's like now. So I will, uh, I will do that. And maybe the best way that I could do that is uh, when I first come into the program, I didn't get it right away. Um, I had uh, went back out a number of times. Until uh, I went to a, a meeting, a speaker's meeting up in Estes Park, so outside of Colorado, Denver, Colorado. And that was there where I met Don P. And uh, he had this book. It was so used. He had rubber bands and the pages were coming out of it. And uh, 
It was in there. He looked at me, and he had a presence about him. For those of you who know who that man is, and uh, that's how it happened. I sat down there, and he looked at me with those blue eyes, and uh, he's an Indian guy, and uh, that was uh, a change. And uh, he told a story that I connected to immediately. Uh, I guess in our culture, stories are very powerful. Um, and uh, right away, I, I understood what was going on. He told a story about this boxing match. And he said, and there was this big arena. And there was, uh, in one corner was uh, a person in the white trunks that was alcohol. In the other corner, opposite in the black trunks uh, was me. And I was sitting there. And uh, people started to come in that arena. And me and alcohol were just kind of looking at one another a little bit. And of course, what they do at those type of events, they always block off and reserve the front rows. That's where it's reserved for your family so that they can get the best view. And so uh, my family walked in there and uh, they removed that ribbon and they all let them sit there right in front so they could see very well what was about to happen. And so the time came for it to start, and the referee called us both out, and uh, and the referee said, there's some rules here. He said, uh, you know, there's no hitting below the belt, and when I say break off, break off, and explained a lot of the rules, and uh, me and alcohol both agreed to those rules, and we hit the gloves and did the deal. And so we uh, went and sat back in the corner, and uh, somehow the alcohol and I, we were connecting. We were watching each other. We were studying each other very, very carefully. And so the bell rang, and we came out, and we boxed around there, and it wasn't too bad. I mean, we, you know, it was kind of fun and uh, doing that deal. And the uh, bell rang, we sat down, and uh, I looked out there, really intense, the alcohol, and was really looking back, kind of had this smile on his face, like it knew something. And so we got out there, and we were dancing around, boxing around some more, and I don't know how it happened. I must have had to let my guard down, but the alcohol seemed to sneak in a real lucky punch. It just stung me really good. And uh, it kind of surprised me. I look at the alcohol, and he said, oh, that was just a lucky punch. He said, you can whip me. And when he said that, somehow, within my innermost self, I knew what the alcohol told me was true. I knew that I had the power to whip that alcohol. So uh, after the first few rounds, this alcohol is starting to do this more frequently. It's just really stinging me really good. Even one time, I, I, I very early, hit it below the belt. And I looked at that referee, and the referee didn't say anything. It's like he didn't see what was going on. So as I noticed, when I sit down between the rounds, I started to see the people started to walk out of there. They started to leave because I think they detected what was going to happen there was a very boring fight. <laughs> and so uh, I was focused on alcohol. We got out there by the time we are in our middle rounds, and now alcohol is stinging me almost at will. And each time it says to me, you can whip me. And each time it said that, from my innermost self, I knew what the alcohol was doing is telling me the truth. They could see my secret power that I had, my willpower. And so I uh, got up there in the rounds a little bit higher, and uh, I'm staring at the alcohol, and by then I kind of looked around, and everybody was gone except my family. They were still sitting in that front row getting that good view. And by then my eyes were swelled shut and the alcohol had, uh, was really hurting. But it sat over there with that smile on and I was attracted to that. It had like a power. And uh, I kept thinking, I can whip you. And finally I, I sit there and I felt this tug on my arm and it was one of my daughters. And I looked at her and I said, what? And she says, mom says to tie you, let's Let's go. She said, just climb down out of here. She says, we'll give you a ride home. We'll all go home. And I looked down at her and I said, daughter, I said, you tell your mama just one more round. I'm going to make some moves on this round. You just tell her to sit there and watch. <laughs> so I got out there and uh, 
I wasn't able to maneuver exactly how I wanted to, to do that. But the alcohol was almost intentionally hitting below the belt and uh, in, uh, doing a lot of things that wasn't right. And the referee wasn't saying anything. And it really started to do some damage that last round. And so I went back and I sit down there again and uh, so my eye was barely open. I looked at the alcohol. I could see it just kind of a blur. And I'm getting really focused now. And pretty soon I felt this tug on my arm and I looked down there and it was my son. And I looked at him and I said, what? And he says, Mama says to tell you, we're going to leave. We want you to come with us. Please. He said, please. Daddy says, come with us. And I looked down at him and I said, just one more round. I said, you watch. I said, I got a secret move. I'm going to do it now. (laughs) Sit here and watch. I said, I figured it out. And so we got out there and uh, by this time, uh, alcohol had me right on my knees. And it was screaming, you can whip me. And I kept saying to my inner myself, I can do this, I can do this. And pretty soon it was stomping on my head and kicking and bruising. And uh, I laid there, all I could really see at alcohol was just its tenor shoes. And I'm not exactly sure when my family left. But they did. They couldn't take any more of what was going on there. And so uh, they walked out of there, and I was looking at the alcohol's tenor shoes, and I said, I think the alcohol is lying. I said, I think it knows how to whip me, and it didn't. So I crawled out of that arena, and uh, I got out there, kind of healing up, and putting a little salve on, and talking to a few people, found a self-help book. Now one day I started thinking. (laughs) There was another move that I knew about. So I put on my gloves and I went down there. Didn't know if alcohol was going to be there or not. But when I got to that there, alcohol was standing in the corner with its arms on the ring. And I said, alcohol, I said, I'm back. And the alcohol said, I knew you would be. He said, because you can whip me. And I said, I got some moves. <laughs> the elders taught me some moves or whatever. But I went in there and he didn't even allow me to get in the ropes. The alcohol put me down immediately. Just right away. Kick, bruise, stump. And... Um, I would once again was looking at the alcohol's tenor shoes. And so I crawled out of that arena again. And I got out there. And I found a new self-help book. <laughs> and I got thinking again about that alcohol. And so I put on those gloves one more time. And after I healed some and I went back in there. And I said, alcohol, I'm back. Yes, I knew you would be. And I went in there, and you know the story, immediately looking at the tenor shoes. And it took what it took, but it was that moment that I was absolutely able to experience and understand that line in the big book, that one must fully concede to the innermost self that you're alcoholic, you have this disease. And that was my turning point. So I called out of that uh, arena on August 10th, 1978, and I have not found it necessary to return to that arena. And it took that for me to come to you. I knew about AA. I didn't know what it was, but I knew what it was about. So I was living in downtown. I was living in Colorado Springs, and there was a meeting downtown. So um, 
I went in the afternoon and I scouted it out where that address was on Tehom Street. And so uh, I didn't tell anybody, but that night at meeting started at 8 o'clock. I went down there a little bit before and I seen the cars started to park in that area. And there was one slot right in front of where the door was. And so I drove by that and I said, you know, I'm going to go around this block. And if I come around that block and that slot is there, I'm going to go in there. <laughs> so I drove around that block and I come around and that slot was still there. And everybody seemed to be parking on the other side of the street. So I slowed my old res car down some. And I looked at that slot and I says, I'm going to go around that block one more time. <laughs> <clears throat> and if that spot is there, I'll, I'll go in there. So I drove as slow as that car would go around that block. And would you know that darn slot was still there. So I parked in that slot and I, I went up those stairs and uh, there was a man there, a greeter. I think if he wasn't there, I think I would have changed my mind. Because I, there was all these things, but anyway... He greeted me and he welcomed me in there. And I walked in the room and I looked around. And the first observation I had, I says, Oh my God, these are all white people. I said it in here. <laughs> but anyway, I got a cup of coffee in the chair and I sit down. And I don't remember a lot about that meeting. Uh, Mostly why I remembered about that meeting was things I didn't like. One of the things I didn't like is I couldn't believe that these people were telling about their weaknesses. They were saying they were selfish and dishonest and self-centered, you know. And I thought, man, these are some stupid white people. Why are they <laughs> saying that? Like where I come from, you never told nobody nothing. You see, like that. The other thing drove me nuts was the laughter. <laughs> Jesus, they would tell something and they just laugh and belly laugh and everything else. And you know, there was nothing funny. <laughs> I could see. Nothing. But the other thing that I come out of there with that I didn't understand until much later, there was a feeling. I didn't know what that was. But there was a feeling there. I couldn't even have explained it, but there was something. By, I had been to AA enough to know there were certain things that I was told I ought to do that I wasn't willing to do. I wasn't at first willing to get a sponsor. That's not something I was willing to do because I always did everything myself. And so... Uh, when I came back off that last drunk, I had all the, the resistance beat out of me. I had no resistance when I came to you. I don't care what it was. The alcohol had taken whatever that was away. I was ready. So I knew that I had to get a sponsor. And I was kind of watching this guy for a long time. I watched him how he was in meetings. and uh, He's kind of a rough guy. <coughs> But there was something about him, he's like an elder, a rough elder. <laughs> you know, but he had that thing that I was attracted to. So after that meeting, I watched, I knew where he went, and I went and I asked him if he would be my sponsor. And he said, ah, we'll get some coffee, we'll talk about it. So we sit down at the table, and uh, Frank, he was... Um, maybe close to 6'6 six, six or 6'7. Six, he was a big man. He was uh, very scarred up. He was, uh, you never doubted whether Frank was an alcoholic or not. You knew he was. <laughs> and in my opinion, he was hit with an ugly stick very, very young. <laughs> and after I talked to him for a little while, I found out he was very sarcastic. And very judgmental. And so as we sat there and talked, I saw him sizing me up. He was scanning me like that. You know, looking at me and he, you know, he had to... So anyway, he said, you know, he said, I've been sober for 
He said, over 15 years. He said, I watch you Indians come in here all the time. He said, just sit way in the back row. And he said, you come in a little late and you leave a little bit early. And he said, uh, you don't say nothing. You guys just all sit in the back row. He said, uh, maybe you last two months. But he says, mostly you don't. He said, you guys are really weird. He said, you don't say nothing. We don't know what you're thinking. None of that. He said, you don't get this at all. But he said, I, I watch you. See, so do that. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been like uh, when you were a child that your somebody got you a little puppy. You know how sometimes you, you're a kid with a puppy. You tease it. You know, it's like you rub its face like that, you know, and then it starts to growl and you rub it some more. Like That's how I felt he was doing to me. <laughs> You guys don't make it. And there's something wrong with you. And I remember, <laughs> I sat there and I stared at this old man. I looked him really strong in the eye like that. I used to stare at him when I got upset with him. And I remember I was thinking to myself, I says, I'll show you, you white son of a bitch. I said, I'll make it. I'll make it. But that's how where I was at the time, you know. And he said to me, he said, uh, he said, you know, he said, uh, I, I, I just now decided, he said, I'm going to be your friend for the rest of your life. He said, you don't even need to like. It's got nothing to do with you. He said, I just decided I'm going to be your friend. <laughs> and he said, there are some things that I can, uh, I can give you. He said, one is, he said, uh, he said, I'll be your friend. And he says, the next thing I can give you is some hope. He said, because uh, I know something you don't. <laughs> he said, I know how to stay sober. You don't know how to stay sober. So there's something that I have that you want. And uh, he said, I'll tell you some things I'm not. He said, I'm not your taxi cab. Don't be calling. I ain't your banker. I ain't your hotel. And it is a whole list of things he said that he wasn't. And uh, so he said how this will work. And he grabbed that big book of AA. And he showed me about how many pages was 164 pages. And he looked at me and he said, if you do exactly what's in these 164 pages, he said, you will never have to drink again. He said, this program isn't about slipping. And all the stuff that you hear. He said, this program is designed, given to us by the Creator, is that you come in here, and if you are willing to do these instructions, you will never have to drink again. <laughs> and that was uh, maybe the first time I started to feel what it felt like to have tears flow. I could feel that lump coming because I wasn't used to having those tears flow because I tried everything. (laughs) And when I heard that, whatever that was, I knew he was telling me the truth. So he said, <laughs> So he took a schedule. By then I had moved to Denver and he took a schedule and he said, uh, you are to attend six meetings. I will choose the meetings that you will attend. <laughs> so one night it was a big book study, traditions. So every night there was a meeting I was to attend. Sunday night was my meeting, a choice. I could go to whatever meeting I wanted. <laughs> and he said, you go to this meeting, and when you get there, you just say your name is Don, you say you're alcoholic, and he said, don't say nothing else because you got nothing of any value to anybody <laughs> You know nothing. 
until you take the third step. Then we'll consider letting you say some things. <laughs> and so I went to these meetings, and I followed what he said. But, of course, you know, in a place, they, if they know who's your sponsor, they know what the deal is, too. They know you've got to go there and not talk, because that's the way he did it. <laughs> and so I went there, and I was... Uh, then he showed me the instructions in that big book. You know, I had uh, looked at that big book before, but I could never find the instructions in it. In fact, it was the most boring book I ever read in my whole life. <laughs> but then when he started to show me, these pages is the instructions for this step. And so he showed me the pages for step one. And he said, uh, what... What is going on in your life right now, he says, you actually made your life a lot more simpler than you thought because right now the only problem you have in your whole life is the step you're on. Your other problems now have changed. And that when no matter what meeting you go to, if you're on step one, you listen from the point of view of step one. Whatever is going on there. And so uh, I, I, went, I went to meetings every night just like how he told me. My name's Donna. I'm an alcoholic. Now, after about four months, I, I went to this meeting, and uh, who would walk in but this Indian woman would walk in. And I could tell the way she looked at me right away, I knew she had her eye on me. <laughs> we was connecting. <laughs> and so I sat there, and uh, I got thinking to myself, you know, you're not going to make any points if you just say your name's Don, you're alcoholic, and you don't say anything. This is not good. You've got to at least quote the book or do something, you know. <laughs> so it came my turn to speak and to come around, and that's exactly what I did. Man, I was doing like 4.49, you know, and page 86. <laughs> God, you got the biggest smile on her face. I knew it was at least a cup of coffee after that meeting. <laughs> And so we did, and we got a cup of coffee over at the Village Inn, and uh, boy, I was so happy. I was coming back to this little part of my head. I was strutting. I mean, I was, you know. <laughs> but anyway, I got in there, and uh, I wasn't in my apartment. Fifteen seconds, the phone rang. <laughs> and I was so up. I was so happy. You know, I pick up the phone, and I go, Hello. And you know who it was, right? <laughs> what the hell are you doing moving your lips, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, the sponsors are like an internet, you know? They're, they're everywhere, you know? They know everything. So, uh... I continued to uh, go to those meetings and, uh, and work, and then uh, we got done with step one, verse 43 pages. And then we got to the second half of step one, and he, he showed me what he called the unmanageability paragraph. It's located on page 52 of the big book. And it says, we were having problems with our personal relationships. We couldn't control our emotional nature. We were full of fear. And he had me take that sentence and flip it into a question. And I had to take a look at my relationships with others. So I put my children down there, friends, work. And what I had to take a look at and think about was when I interacted with those people, not what did they do, but how did I handle that? And what I saw is I run, I judge, I put them down, I was self-centered, I retaliated, I got even. I had another whole deal going on, and I turned around and I thought that was all their fault. I didn't know that I was reacting a certain way. I never looked at that before. I didn't even know how to look at myself. And so as I started to look at that, and then I saw my emotional nature. When I'm angry, what do I do? And when I'm depressed, what do I do? When I'm happy, what do I do? And when I'm in self-pity, what do I do? And I started to see this whole world that I was living in 
and I could see why my life was unmanageable. And so I got all nine of those areas done, and I could see step one. I could see that powerless over alcohol, and I could see the unmanageability in my life was caused by me. But I didn't know how to do anything else, not the way I was raised, and all those other things. That's how I reacted normally. That was normal to me, was to retaliate, get even. That's just, that was the deal. So when we got done with that, he showed me in uh, chapter two, we agnost, uh, chapter uh, uh, for solutions, we agnostics it was for uh, chapter two. And so uh, I had to read that 25 times. And then as we got into step two, he had me create nine visions. He said the steps are all interconnected with each other. One is dependent on another in a very natural order. And so when I got uh, to do the work on step two, I took a look at this work with uh, my unmanageability of personal relationships. Then he had me create a vision of what would it look like if it, one were working. In other words, came to believe that a power greater than yourself could restore you to sanity. Sanity, you know, having that sound mind. So I had to do some work with him, getting the idea, well, what would it look like if it were Working, And he said, you didn't have to, when you do that, you don't have to be willing fully. You could be half willing. You could be kind of willing. You could be kind of maybe sometimes most of the time willing on Tuesdays and Fridays, whatever. Any of that was more than enough to make it work. And he said, most of this work will be done actually out of your current belief system. And when I got that done, he showed me that. I showed it to him. And he said, now this work that you are, have done in step two, this will be your spiritual awakening in step 12. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. He said, you just did. If you want an idea, sneak preview of what that's going to be, you just did that. So I had things in there like, you know, um, you know, with, with women, or um, at that time, I, you know, I was still married, but I, I had that inner that I would be kind and tolerant, and I'd be loving and forgiving. And it was like this, like this. When I was doing that work, it's like this little, the little people was on my shoulder. You know, I'd be right, kind and tolerant, like jerking my earlobe and saying, like, "Who are you trying to shit?" I don't think I could <laughs> see you being like kind and tolerant. But he said, don't worry about how is it going to happen. Don't worry about when. But that the possibility exists that a power would be able to do this. And so I went ahead and did that. And then from there, he took me into the third step, which I had some hesitation about the third step. Whoever wisdom it was that put God as you understand him, that really saved my, in that third step. And the way that uh, Frank worked that is uh, he considered every line in a big book was an instruction or a sentence that you had to connect to your experience. So when he said your life is run by self-propulsion, when we went over that, I had to share with him what I thought that meant based on my life experience. That I was the actor and I was manipulating, even trying to be kind, and I was self centered. And so we went through the whole thing. And then he showed me in that book, he said, The third step gives you five concepts of a higher power. It ain't a doorknob. He said, It's not in there. He said, It lays it right out. There's five things to consider. And, uh, there was a point in my sobriety that he had me at certain times look up every word in a big book with a dictionary but it's four letters or more because he said, you're really, your mind, he used to tell me about my mind. And uh, so we went through that and I, uh, so when I was, I was going to meetings, I was on third step, so I listened from the third step point of view. And I had a hard time coming to do that for a couple of reasons. One is like on our reservation, you know, they have a, some of you won't know what it is, but they have like boarding schools and mission schools, you know, and, uh, you know, when I was growing up, that's where we went. So uh, it depended upon which church had the money, I guess, you know, one, we just had one church, so they, one would leave, another one would come in, and they'd, 
and then they'd leave another one come in. And so they always had food and uh, clothes that they always gave you. So, but you never got them till after the pitch. You know, you had to <laughs> go to the sermon. You know, whatever. So that's the way they do it. So you know, one would come in. Maybe you know, I think they were called Pentecostals or whatever. And so then. We, we all had to, you know, do all this stuff, and uh, you know what, you know, and then um, go and eat and stuff like that. Then zip, they'd lose the money, and then you wait a couple months, and the Catholics would come in, you know, and um, so we were just kind of used to the missionaries coming and going, and you, you gotta be doing this, you know, and then they would tell you, good thing the other one's not here, because if you belong with that, you go to hell. We are the ones that have the way, you know. Uh, so it's kind of confusing because they're all kind of, you know, you didn't know which one was it, you know, was the right one as they came and went. And, you know, you take a little Indian kid, when you see like a nun, they're different today, but in the nuns, they were dressed in a certain kind of uniform. And, uh, boy, they're big when you're a little kid. They're scary, <laughs> you know. You just, uh, they didn't have discipline problems, you know, and... Uh, and they would explain this thing about God, you know, and here I come here, you've you got to turn your life over to care of God. And, um, you know, like, it's, if I remember these stories, like when we were little, they'd say, like, have you ever been burned with a cigarette? I'd say, well, yeah. Well, in hell, your whole body's a blister. <laughs> and, you know, you can just, whoa. It just gives you chills, you know. And then you say, you, you ever been thirsty? Well, there ain't no water in hell. <laughs> then you say, now you want to see God. You go, you bet I do. You bet I do. <laughs> but it was like you had the flames of hell licking your ass, you know. And you're <laughs> and that's how I thought God was, you know. You, do it or you go to hell and now you're asking me once again to uh, you know to do this and so I was processing <laughs> what that step was until I was in a meeting one time and I heard this man tell a story and he said uh, he said there were these this pond and there was a log on there and there was four frogs sitting on this log and he said one of those frogs made a decision to jump in the water and they said, uh, how many frogs are left? I said, three. He said, no, still four frogs. But one of them decided. But that frog, when it decided, he says, how that connects to the third step is God makes that the orange frog. So you three green ones. You make a decision to turn your life new well over. God makes you orange. And I had some confusion, you know, in, uh, in, the, in these rooms because you would hear people in meetings, they say, but... You know, the will about, well, I took my will back and I turned it over and I turned it over and I took it back and I turned it over and I took it back and I turned it over and I took it back. And you're going, you know, I was going, how the heck does that work? You know, <laughs> you turn your life over and then you take it back and then something happens, you give it back and you turn it over. And uh, the way that this man said, he said, once you turn your life over and you become an orange frog, he said, that's it. So what happens if you turn your life over, say, on Monday, become orange frog? Monday, and then Wednesday, you get all pissed off at somebody. He said, you're just a pissed off orange frog. <laughs> so what happens on Saturday if you go get drunk? He said, you are now a drunk orange frog. <laughs> and where my mind was, I went, duh, I got it. <laughs> so I went over to Frank and... Uh, I called him up, made my appointment, and I said, I was so excited. He says, Frank, I want to become an orange frog. <laughs> so anyway, that night we went through that book. And uh, line by line, I had to tell him my experience. Was I an actor? Oh, you're an actor. And then he says, like, do you do the, do the little Indian thing in front of white people? You know, and so I had to really be honest you know, about many, many things, the games that I played in front of certain people. And so uh, that night we got through with that. And me and that old man, we got on our knees and we held hands and we read that third step prayer. 
And uh, he read it first, held that book open, and then I read that third step prayer. So when that was done, I said, what next? He reached behind his chair and he bought out a tablet and a ruler. And by the time I left there, I was writing a five-step resentment inventory, a four-step fear inventory, and an 11-step sex inventory. You know, where, as you, so where you design yourself. But he had me make a column for each one so I could see the patterns much better. And so I went ahead and uh, I wrote that inventory. And he especially warned me about the dark crannies that I had to tell everything. Everything. The sick sexual things, the secrets, money I stole, all those things I did, I had to have it in there. The only instruction I I did was uh, I wrote the inventory in those columns, like he said, but I wrote the sick stuff on a different sheet of paper. (laughs) And when I got my inventory done, I knew it was good. I had. I did a lot of sick, sick, sick shit that I felt bad about and all that, you know. But I knew it was all on there. I knew it was. So it came time this Friday... uh, I was to, uh, I could tell I either had the fifth step or drink and it was going to happen that night because I couldn't bring myself to do it. But you know how you get those, your wrists and you start going and I start thinking I'm going to go there for a pack of cigarettes and uh, I could see that thinking coming and uh, I could see it increasing. I knew it was either fifth step or drink. And so uh, I call up Frank and uh, they just take him to the hospital. He went there. So I called another guy. Didn't answer his phone. Was, you know, it's kind of hard, like when you're new and you, you, you don't know all the things you know. But I called this third man, and he knew. He said, he says, "Do you have fifth step to do?" I said, "Man, yeah, I say I do." He says, "Come on over, I'll do the coffee pot." So we went over there, and uh, I had my little notebook, and I was reading it, you know. And uh, when we got done, he said, "Is that it?" I said, "Yeah, that's it." I said, "This one just too bad." So he said, I'm going to make us another pot of coffee. And, uh, <laughs> so as he was making that coffee, he was just sharing with me some of the stuff that was on his first fifth step. And I remember as he was shared this with me, I thought, man, this white guy's way sicker than me. You know, he is really sick. So then I finally I thought, you know, and he told me some really juicy stuff. See, I didn't know he was free. I thought, okay, okay. I I, I, I have another little bit of paper here <laughs> that I'll share with you. But I got thinking in my mind, you know, if you tell on me, I'll tell on you. That's what the deal was, you know. <laughs> but I went through and uh, I started to share that and it was hard. And some of it, he just put his hand on my shoulder and he said, just, just say the next one. And it was like the, my throat was closed, and uh, I, I didn't want to tell him about how I was sexually abused and what this uncle did, and all those things that would happen. I never told nobody when I was nine, ten, and eleven what happened, just like around sexual abuse. And then the man that did it was my uncle, and it was my mother's most favorite brother. And then one night there was a big party on the res. It got kind of wild. Somebody shot him six times right in the chest. And when he got shot, I was overjoyed. I was happy. But I watched what that did to my mom. That was my mother's most favorite. And I carried all that stuff around. And um, I was able to, uh, with the help of that man, and admit it to myself, to the creator and God, what that was. And they all came out. And so he said, you go home, and uh, he said, I'm going to stay by the phone. You've got to review the first five proposals. And then he said, there's a set of promises there on that fifth step. He said, when you, he said, there's every odd step has a set of promises, but they all have a condition. Withholding nothing, this happens. Withhold something, they don't. And so I was taught about these promises. And so when it says you can look at the world in the eye and be at perfect peace and ease. And I, I didn't understand what those things were. And for the first time, I, I, I was amazed 
Like I go back and think of something that I would feel guilty, bad, or what about, and I could remember the story, but the feelings change. But the best way I can describe this experience, maybe for the first time in my life, was is to, um, I'll share with you a story, and it's a story about the uh, eagle that was raised by chickens. <laughs> and as this uh, farmer, he uh, had this farm, and uh, he heard these two gunshots, and he walked over there, and somebody killed two eagles. The male and the female eagle were laying there on the ground, and he said, oh my God, who could do such a thing? And all of a sudden, he uh, Heard a noise, he looked up, and there's a big nest up there in the tree. So he climbed up there, and sure enough, there are two little eagles in that nest. And he says, Oh no, man. So he he stuck them in his pocket. He said, I'll do something with them. He said, I can't leave them here to die. So he's walking back, got by the farm, and he come past the chicken coop, and he said, Well, hell, I'll just throw them in the chicken and see what happens. So threw those two little eagles, and, uh, and uh, they was accepted immediately. And so uh, a little time went on, and this one eagle looked at his brother, and he says, Brother, he says, something's not right here. He said, there's something just not right. He says, even when we try to crow, he says, we sound really weird. It doesn't sound right. And when we scratch, he said, we, it don't work very well. And his brother said, look, just leave well enough alone. He said, just, it's just, just, just you know, it's okay. So a little time went on, and uh, of course they grew a little bit, and their, their feathers changed, and uh, they had that talk again. His brother said, look, well, I could, we, he says, something's really wrong. Well, by this time, the other, his brother Eagle had grown enough that the chicks was looking at him. <laughs> and so he was grooming his feathers and doing his hair. So this Eagle thought he was... He thought he was in heaven because they was really attracted to him. So he said, bro, just leave it alone. Don't mess with nothing. <laughs> so a little time went by and spring came and the farmer said, you know, he said, the spring's here. I'm going to let all these chickens out and uh, they can get some fresh worms and things. So he opened up the door and they all got out and they're, you know, getting the grub rooms and everything. And uh, just one eagle happened to stroll down this road. And all of a sudden he heard this laughter, this belly laugh. Ha, 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 just laughing. He's looking all around to see he was laughing. And finally he looked up and there was an owl sitting in the tree. And the owl is just laughing. And uh, he said, what are you laughing at? He said, I'm laughing at you because you're acting like a chicken. He said, you're not a chicken. He said, you're an eagle. I am not. He said, I'm a ch-. you know. So they argue back and forth. So finally the owl flew down and he landed right by that little eagle and he said get on my wings hop on my back he said, but hang on so he hopped on that owl's back and he took off and uh, you know it's, it's kind of heavy so he had to find like a runway almost you know, but anyway he took off and he got some air currents and he started riding and finally circling around he got way up and that eagle is hanging on he's got his eyes closed like this every once in a while he opened up his eye and he closed it and he's just scared you know and so uh the owl is explaining to him, you know, you carry the prayers to the Creator and you're, this is your place and everybody loves you and, and he respects you. And uh, all he could, finally he said to the owl, he says, take me back down, take me back down. But you, no, 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 I, I'm a chicken. He said, take me back down there. And the owl says, you got to listen to me. It's like a sponsor, you know. <laughs> so anyway... Finally, uh, he couldn't convince him. And so finally, the owl, he zigzagged back and forth like this a couple of times. He says, sorry, little brother. And he made this loop and he dumped him off. And that owl went tumbling down to the sky. And so the owl went to dive right alongside him. Spread your wings, spread your wings. No, I can't, I can't, it hurts. No, you got to spread them, man. you got to spread them, you know. It's this fourth and fifth step. Got to spread them. I can't, I can't. Finally, it hurts. I know it hurts. Spread them. So finally, he, he got his wings out just enough and he, he finally caught the air currents and went, whoa. And so he is just, he, yeah, instinct kicked in. He just kind of knew. You know, he started to get a feel for it, like something inside. And 
So the owl is, the sponsor is following them around, you know. And finally the eagle says, man, I think I remember how to do a flip. Something inside of me, you know. So he put his tail down and wow, he just did a flip. And he couldn't believe. And he said, I got to talk to my brother. So he went back down, quick as he could, got in a chicken coop near his brother is. Make him. <laughs> Snagging another one, you know. So finally, he got uh, his brother down there, talked to the owl. He wouldn't believe it, got on his back. Rode the air currents, finally got up there. Wouldn't listen either. Spread your wings, spread your wings. I can't, I can't, it hurts. So he dumped him. And when he went tumbling, finally, he also was able to spread his wings. And that's the way when I got done with that fifth step. I remember my sponsor when I wrote that third column. He said, what's going to come out in there? See, I thought I was writing the truth about myself. That's what I thought I was writing. He said, no. He said, what you're writing in that third column is the truth about the lie. That's what you're writing. You're no good. There's no way. You can't do it. You're an idiot. You're not the right color. You're not the right sex. You're a, you're a, you're a, you're a. And I walked around thinking that's who I was. And that thinking who I was led me to that, to escape with that alcohol. That's all I could do. I couldn't stand who I was. I would fog up a mirror in the bathroom so I didn't have to see what was in there. I couldn't, and I couldn't quit doing it was the damn thing. I didn't know how to stop doing that. And so, that was my experience with that fifth step. I become an eagle. I become an Indian. I could come back to that culture again. And I wanted to be an Indian. I wanted to sing. And I wanted to learn that drum. Just something woke up. It's like those ancestors within that just came out. It started, you see, to do that. And then out of that, I was able to define my character defects. And I was taught how to do that in making my amends. A lot of funny amends stories. But when I was uh, maybe four years sober, I, um, I took these steps to the elders. And I laugh about it now. As, uh, I said, I want to talk to you about this white man's way. They're called the 12 Steps. And so I explained these 12 steps to them. And when I got done with that, they said, oh, that's not a white man's way. They said, that's an Indian way. <laughs> and they said, the only thing that we would change is we would take those 12 steps and put them in a circle. So they taught me to put steps one, two, three in the east. And that's that, like, new sun, new day. That's where you find your relationship with your higher power. Steps four, five, six in the south. That's where you find your relationship with yourself, the inventory steps. You know your strength and your weaknesses. Steps seven, eight, nine in the west, the inventory steps. That's where you got to go and forgive, set everything right. That's the direction with your relatives. It's established now, I'm established with my relations with everyone. Steps 10, 11, 12 in the north, that's the elder's wisdom. So all of a sudden, we put the steps in a circle, and it seemed like I was just home. It was so natural to see everything in a circle, because that's how Grandpa taught me when I lived with my Grandpa. So the way that I was sponsored, I was taught to go through the steps every year prior to my AA anniversary. Last July, I finished my 27th path through the steps of AA. <laughs> Not to discourage anybody, but that set of steps that I went through was the hardest, most difficult. It was four times worse than when I processed the steps used my sexual abuse. Because you're long-term sober, don't think you got it. You have it made. I asked the creator to help me. I always knew something was missing, something was wrong. 
and it was time the creator allowed me to see this root was doubt didn't happen a long, 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 long time ago connected to everything and my daughter was she watched me go through that three days I really, really struggled she'd bring me food you know, like sit it by the door and you know, take off because she's in recovery she knows I was doing what I needed to do I wasn't in danger but sometimes when you have that that honesty and you've got to admit that this is what you did and this is what happened and this is what was your part of it but I came out of that so it wasn't it doesn't to me the longer you're sober the harder it is the rewards are greater in doing the work the steps today are the they're very difficult for me and I never go through them alone I always have somebody take me through them because I learned one of the things I learned in this process is my ego loves to analyze itself <laughs> boy and is that a trip <laughs> oh you caught me let me tell you what's wrong with me and then that'll tell you and it just puts on another mask and there I go into delusion again When Johnny looking cloud, I asked him one time, I'm a close here, but he asked him one time, I said, Johnny, I said, teach me to pray. I want to know how to pray. So he said, okay. So he said, you've got to get up really early in the morning and you watch for when that sun first comes over the horizon and it will raise up and until it's a full circle. He said, there's a window there. That's when the birds sing the flowers, there's a lot of activity goes on. Then when it gets higher, they quit singing. He said, pray at the window in the morning. So I open up my big book on awakening. Consider your plans. Ask God to direct your thinking to do it. I do it exactly that way. And after a little time went on, I remember I sat out there one morning and uh, I don't know where they come from, but it must have been 200 birds came there, robins and blue jays. and They, were, they was just singing, and I was just praying. I was going, oh, right, man, this is really cool. So I called Johnny Looking Cloud up, and I said, man, this prayer shirt really works. I said, there was 200 birds out there singing, and I'm praying, and I'm doing this. And he said, nephew, he said, those birds have been singing every morning. <laughs> and it was there, but I didn't see it. I didn't know what was going on. So then a uh, little time went by and uh, I was praying like that every morning and all of a sudden the eagles would start to come and you know how that says messengers would come like that and I was going, wow, this prayer stuff really works. I called Johnny looking called up, you know. Man, this prayer stuff's really cool. I said, the eagles are coming and feathers are coming and he said, nephew, they've always been there. They've always been there. So I started to realize there's a lot of things that's always been there. I just didn't see it. But you guys are the ones that helped me to see that thing that has always been there. God has always loved me. He didn't just start loving me. He always did. It was like that. A lot of people told me I was a chicken. And they fed me chicken stuff. And I walked around, I was an Indian, I was acting like a chicken. But I found I ain't a chicken. I'm developing into a healthy native man. I was 12 years sober, I looked in the mirror one day, and it was the first time I think ever in my life, I looked at myself and I said, you know something, you're kind of cool to be around with. <laughs> yeah. So I go through this work, and uh, I can't believe that the Creator has allowed me to do the things that I'm doing. There's a website called whitebison.org. Some of you can check it out. And you'll see like the rest of the story or page two, whatever it is. Just doing some uh, incredible things the Creator has allowed me to do. I have um, eight children all together. Some of those children are my children by the Indian way, we call it. I have 15 grandchildren. Number 16 is coming in uh, September. 
the 16th one. I'm allowed to go and take those babies anytime I want. There was a day I was not allowed to do that. Um, I would say this. If I were to say what was the worst thing, I've had to pick one of the worst things in the drinking years, what would it be? I would pick the loneliness. It appears like a hole. And you do all kinds of stuff to fill that hole. And uh, what I found out from you was uh, it was the creator that I was looking for. I didn't know that. If I were to pick the best thing that has happened is the relationship that I have with my creator. It is so cool. I don't live a life where I have ever, no matter what goes on, a feeling that God is left. I don't live a life that way. In the book, it says that the possibility, it talks about possibilities. It talks about the possibility of another dimension. It says that you have the possibility of carrying a vision of God's will into every area of your life. God's will in my life is not a mystery. I don't wonder what is that anymore. And I've learned that I have to grow in effectiveness, and I have to come to you, my teachers. So I'll kind of close with this. There was a time I went home one time to our reservation, and I was raised in hell there. And, uh, you know, uh, but some of my relatives, they took me in a car, and they took me to the edge of the res, and they said, don't come back here no more. You're crazy. You know, you're, we're all ashamed of you. Don't, don't come back here anymore. And so I knew what they were saying. I was doing things I didn't know how to stop doing. Then where do I end up <coughs> with you guys? And when I did the crazy shit, what you said is keep coming back. <laughs> so I know it won't happen, but if the Creator ever came and said... Grasshopper? No. <laughs> you need to make a choice. The choice is you, you have to choose either AA or you have to choose your tribe. I would choose you guys if I had to do that because you are my tribe. You are the one. So I'll close with this prayer, and that's the prayer you taught me too. And this prayer it says, God, thank you for what you've given me. God, thank you for what you've taken from me. And God, thank you for what you've left me. And this is this tribe. You're the ones that I, uh, I depend upon. Thank you very much.